So again, Psalm 136 is where we're going to be today, so you can go ahead and get that in front of you, uh, whether you open up a Bible or power up a Bible, however you do that, uh, Psalm 136 is where we're going to be. This is a message series that we come back to from time to time, we call Rhythms. The whole conviction behind this series is that the most important decisions in life are not always the decisions that feel like the most important decisions in life. The biggest decisions that we make are not always the big decisions. It's not the who do I marry decisions or the what do I study or what career do I pursue decisions that form us the most or shape our lives the most. As important as those decisions are, the most important decisions that we make every day are the everyday rhythm decisions that we make, the tiny decisions that we make about the patterns and practices that we're going to allow to groove in the pattern of our life. And that's not just a preacher conviction anymore. Neurobiology is singing this song these days. Some of you are psychology people, you know that, that neurons that fire together wire together. Business, media, especially social media, is literally taking this idea to the bank. We live in an attention economy where business has learned if they can grab small amounts of your dis- attention, they can get you to make any decision that they want you to make. They can grab your attention, use it as a commodity, and leverage it for their own business. Literally, if they can get you to develop a rhythm of reaching for your phone at every stoplight or in every quiet moment, whenever you're in the restroom, they can get you to buy anything they want you to buy. They can have your money, they can have your emotions, they can have your vote, and they can change your whole worldview for good or bad. And none of that takes a major decision out of you. It just takes a thousand little ones, or maybe more accurately, the same tiny decision every day. So from time to time, we come back to this series and talk about a spiritual rhythm and then commit to practice it together for a while to really groove it into our spiritual lives and get it in the muscle memory of our soul. That's what we're after. Here's what we're gonna do today. So if you've been around for the last several weeks, you know we were in a three-week series. We, we called it Big Mo, where we talked about money for three weeks, talked about momentum, talked about moments, and we stretched each other in some ways that weren't always comfortable for us. So today is a grace day. We're gonna talk about a rhythm today where if you're an American, or at least plan to be in the United States for the next week, taking at least one next step in this rhythm is gonna be pretty simple for all of us. In fact, uh, it's one of those next steps for all of you, you'd almost have to work hard not to take this week. So, uh, even if applying this doesn't feel natural for anyone. I told you, the psalm would have been sung by the whole community of people as whole families or extended families would travel to Jerusalem to celebrate Passover at the temple together. So it's not unlike a Christmas carol that all of the kids sing in the car on the way to grandma's house and everybody knows it and you sing it all the time over and over and over. You just have to imagine a crowd of people walking from wherever they lived, wherever they were coming from, walking towards Jerusalem to the temple to celebrate this feast together. And as you think about that crowd, you have to imagine that that crowd was not totally unlike this crowd journeying towards a different feast in our lives this year. You have to imagine for that crowd in in those days, as they were walking towards that Passover feast, there were some of the people that were walking towards that Passover feast because for one reason or another, that feast was their favorite feast of the entire year. And I bet there are some of us in here today that this week you're walking towards your very favorite holiday the whole year. Anybody in here? This is this Thanksgiving is your favorite holiday, yeah? A couple of you? That's okay. See, this is a no perfect people allowed church. That includes even people that like turkey, yeah? You guys are welcome here. We're glad that you're here. Uh, for the rest of us, some of us are walking towards this feast. It maybe is a, a great feast. It's one that we like. It's not necessarily our favorite, but we're walking towards it this year because we feel like we're excited. We have a whole lot to be thankful for, some of us this year. For some of us to find it especially easy in this crowd to rejoice this year for one reason or another. Like business was great this year, so you got a lot to be thankful for. 
Some of you, you, you started college this year or you transferred colleges. You found your people this year and you're walking into Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving is close to the surface. It's easy to be thankful for a lot. Maybe a new relationship this year, a new baby this year. It was a good year financially for you. Your people won the election this year. Okay, gratitude for some of us is really easy on the journey to Thanksgiving this week as you walk towards a feast. I don't know, some of you are, are here. I want to ask who you are because there's another crowd. Another crowd that's walking alongside you towards the feast this year. I'm certain people who have had almost the exact opposite experience this year. I feel like you're walking into Thanksgiving this year as a part of a crowd, but this year your back is against the wall. Economically, financially, relationally, physically, politically, you're on the other side of hope, maybe for all kinds of reasons. And right now, even being thankful for something is a struggle, despite the fact that everyone around you seems to find it easy. Psalm 136 has something for every single one of us in this crowd. For those of us that struggle, it gives us certain things to grab a hold of. For some of us that are not struggling, it gives us an even deeper gratitude to grab a hold of than some of the places that we found our thankfulness this year, which is important. The truth is, for some of us, gratitude is right up there near the surface because we're sailing in shallow water and we're grateful for shallow things and can't see it, but we're headed for shipwreck. Psalm 136 gives us something even more certain to tie off our gratitude to. So that's what I wanna show us today in Psalm 136. I wanna talk about one, why we can be thankful, and then two, how we could approach gratitude. Why we could approach gratitude and add that to the overall reason or, or rhythms of our life, even beyond Thanksgiving. So why we can and then how we could. First, why we can be thankful. Look at the first three verses of Psalm 136. First three verses say this, give thanks to the Lord for he's good. His love endures forever. Give thanks to the God of gods as love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord of lords. His love endures forever. So anytime you're reading through a passage of scripture, you see something repeated over and over. It's a pretty good indication that the writer wants you to remember something. As you're reading here, it's three different times he says the words, give thanks. And it's a command. He says, give thanks, and then he tells us why. Why give thanks? What does he say? Well, you said it 26 times. <laughs> His love endures forever. And you may know this, the, the word translated here, love, is the Hebrew word hesed, which is a notoriously hard word to translate from Hebrew. It's the word hesed. It refers to God's loyal love to his covenant people who almost never deserve it. So Sally Lord-Jones has the very best translation of this word that's hard to translate. She translates it this way in the children's storybook Bible. The never stopping, never giving up, unbreaking, always and forever love of God. His hesed endures forever. The psalmist says, why? G give thanks. Why give thanks? Because the never stopping, never giving up, unbreaking, always and forever love of God endures, how long? Forever. Literally, it goes until the forever point. So here's a fun little mental experiment for you, okay? Just in your mind, start to draw a timeline, and a timeline that goes all the way to forever. I'll give you a second, okay? You're drawing that timeline in your mind all the way to forever. And when you get to the forever, put a point there. Okay, if you do that, you're going to be here for a little while, aren't you? In fact, how long are you going to be here? <laughs> forever. Because there is no point where forever goes no further. And the psalmist says, that's exactly what I mean. To say it another way, most of us have some version of the phrase, God will love me until, or God will love me unless, 
We have some version of that grooved into our soul, either consciously or maybe even more dangerous, subconsciously. God will love me until, or God will love me unless. There's some point in the future where we say, God's love will go this far for me, but no further. The psalmist, in his best Dwight Schrute voice, says, false. God's love goes infinitely beyond until. God's love goes infinitely beyond until. The song says it 26 times. Have you ever heard somebody talk about a 7-Eleven worship song? The same seven words repeated 11 times. This is a 426 worship song. I'm sure Ezra got emails. I'm joking. <laughs> but the truth is, it, it's probably good for us to sing some 426 worship songs. It's probably good for us to sing some 7-Eleven worship songs too, because when it comes to this song and these words, this is a truth that's pretty hard for some of us to remember. To remember that no matter what our circumstance, no matter our situation, no matter our emotion, no matter our shortcomings, no matter our imperfections, that God loves people who are in a relationship with him, whether or not we deserve it, and his love will go infinitely beyond whatever until we have in mind. Now, that's hard to get a grasp on, right? Because all of us have experienced things in our life that makes us wonder, does God's love go here for me? Now, it's almost like the psalmist anticipates that question because he gives us three big things to tie off our gratitude to when nothing else seems certain. The first one you see in verse one, God's forever love is anchored in his character. You see it in verse one, the, the psalmist says, give thanks to the Lord for he is tov. It's the Hebrew word for good. Tov, and it carries a lot more weight than just what my teenagers say to me when I ask how their day was and they don't want to talk. How was your day? Good. Okay, here's what tov means in Hebrew. I saw a bottle of wine the other day that scored 100 points on some scale. And the little card underneath it described it this way. It called it exquisite, beautiful, towering, unquestionably the finest in any class or vintage, perfection from the nose through the finish. They could have just written tov. That's what the word means. And the psalmist says you can give thanks that God's love goes infinitely beyond until because tov is at the core of God's character. And as the eternal, infinite God of the universe, his character doesn't change. Theologians call it immutability, the immutability of God. It means he doesn't mutate. He doesn't change. He can't improve because he's already perfect. He can't get any better. And because he's perfect, he doesn't have anything inside of him that could cause his perfection to slide. God's character ensures that his love will endure. His tov is as good as it gets, and it can never get less tov than he is. That's great news. But here's a question. Even if that's true, God is tov and he could never change, couldn't something get in the way of it? You remember the solar eclipse earlier this year? The sun never stopped being the sun. The, the sun never stopped shining. But for a little while, something got between us and the sun reaching us. So is it possible when it comes to God's goodness, when it comes to God's love, that he would not stop being good, that he would not stop loving, but there could be something that could get in the way of God's love and prevent his love from reaching us? The psalmist says, ooh, good question. No. Why? Verse two, because he's the God of gods. So God's forever love is anchored in his character, and his supremacy. 
his supremacy. Supremacy means there is no one higher on the organizational chart than God is. Okay, nobody can overrule him. Nobody can overpower him. Listen, nobody can outvote him. Colossians says thrones, powers, rulers, and authorities in heaven and on earth. That pretty much covers it, yeah? That's good news for those of you that feel like you got bad news after the election this year. And that's great news for those of you who feel like you got great news after the election this year. The same person is in charge, ultimately. Your flourishing isn't tied to who lives in the White House. Your hope doesn't have to hitch a ride on Air Force One. But it's bigger than that, it's not just politics. Your boss can't stand in the way of God's good getting to you. Your teachers, your professors can't prevent you from God's best. Popular kid at school doesn't hold your future one way or the other. Your God is the God of gods whose love endures forever. So even when it feels like you're under their thumb, you can give thanks because of God's mighty right hand. So his character, his supremacy, and then finally he says, give thanks to the Lord of lords. And that's related to God of gods, but it's just a little different. God's forever love is anchored in his character, his supremacy, and his sovereignty. His sovereignty. So when he says give thanks to the God of gods, that's primarily talking about the fact that God is greater than any someone. When he says give thanks to the Lord of Lord, he extends it beyond just some ones to all of the some things. He's greater than any situation or circumstance that could ever find you. Anything or anyone outside your control that you think could come between you and God's never ending, never stopping, unbreaking, always and forever love, all of those things will ultimately bow before him. So that's the trifecta, isn't it? Verses one to three, three reasons that we can be grateful on the journey, regardless of where we're coming from, regardless of what we're going through along the way. If all three of those things are true, we have nothing to fear. We have ultimately nothing to want because absolutely nothing will stand in the way of God's never ending, never stopping, never giving up, unbreaking, always and forever love getting to us. And the psalmist could have just stopped there because that is literally all he says through the whole rest of the psalm. He just keeps coming back to those three things. The problem is uh, we don't always remember those three things are true because they're pretty abstract. Abstract things are hard for us to validate even when they're true. When times get tough, when all of the evidence seems to point to the contrary, abstract concepts are really hard to trust. It's hard to remember that God's good when you mourn the death of a person that you love while everyone else is thanksgiving. It's hard to remember that God is the God of gods when people whose God is money and power and recognition seem to constantly get ahead of you in everything they do. It's hard to remember the abstract concept that God is sovereign over all the some things when you flip on the news, when you leave the doctor's office, and everything seems out of control. So the psalmist gives the Israelites three concrete ways to groove this truth into their life and their experience so that it gets out of their head and into their spiritual muscle memory. Verses one to three of the outline. And he starts it and he works backwards. Starting in verse four through verse nine, he points to creation as the most compelling argument that there is a God who is in complete control of everything you see and even the things that you don't. We live in a world, we live in a universe that is fine-tuned to support more than just life. It's fine-tuned to promote flourishing from chaos from the very beginning. Then verses 10 to 22, he points to a history lesson for the people of Israel. Look back to Passover. Passover is the story of God protecting and providing for his people in the land full of other gods. And he reminds them that over and over, God showed that he was the God over all gods. 
He kept them distinct and unique. And at the right time, with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, he led them out, even when it looked like all, all hope was lost for them. And then in verses 23 to 26, he points to their personal provision. God didn't just provide Tov on a cosmic scale. He didn't just provide good at a community or a national level. He's been Tov to and for every single one of us personally. When we were low, when we were under attack, when we were hungry, when we felt distant from him, when we felt like we were his enemies, he came to our personal rescue. His sovereignty, his supremacy, and his character. And he points back to those stories at one level, but think about what the psalmist does and think about this from another level. The psalmist is modeling for us how to be people of thanksgiving, whether or not our circumstances would normally send us there in any given moment. He's modeling it for us and he's inviting us into it in maybe three ways. So here are three ways that we could groove this into our life, even if it doesn't feel like a part of our current experience. The first is through rhythms. Rhythms, you, you could see that even the way that this psalm is written. It's designed to groove gratitude in such a way that thank you is etched into the language and the collective consciousness of a people who think about the people of Israel. Biblically, they had a reputation of being grumblers and complainers about everything. So look, evangelical Christians, we're not that far away from that reputation, are we? Like, look, if, if we weighed our grumbling and complaining against our gratitude privately or corporately, there shouldn't even be a contest. And unfortunately, there's not, but it's often in the wrong direction. So it's worth asking if we find ourselves prone to grumbling and complaining, are there rhythms that we could establish so that gratitude eventually gets grooved into our soul and it forms who we are. Even if that formation takes a long time to groove in, as long as a river carve in a canyon, daily triggers, habits that we just keep coming back to are the rhythms you could establish in your life that keep bringing you back to gratitude. We've got some friends, every time they sit down together for uh, dinner as a family, they share a high, a low, a love, and a wiggle. I love it. They've got young kids, uh, they, they share a, a high, a good thing from the day that they're thankful for. They share a low, a hard thing from the day. They share a love, something that they loved from the day. And then they threw in a wiggle, a signature dance move for the day. I love that. It's a part of their rhythm. It's not just daily rhythms, though, that we could establish for ourselves. There are other rhythms that we can put on our calendar at other frequencies as well. Yeah, so obviously Thursday is a big one for us this year. Every year, Thanksgiving, it comes. wonder if there might be other gratitude rhythms, though, to put on your calendar. Maybe some that are more personal to you. Some friends here at our church, uh, this friend's wife, survived a horrific car accident. And every year on the date of that accident, the anniversary of it, they celebrate Cheat Death Day. They do something really fun together as a family to celebrate Cheat Death Day. The friends that put uh, baptism, they put baptism dates on their calendar. They do something fun as a family to celebrate every single year to remember, to reflect, to look back. Maybe you need a debt-free day on your calendar. Maybe a cancer-free day that you put on the calendar and you come back to every year to remember. So you keep coming back to say thank you. The recovery community, they're awesome at this. I've got several friends that call me every year on the date of their sobriety just so that somebody can celebrate with them. Rhythms, it's one way to groove gratitude into our life over and over and over. So rhythms, the other one is retelling retelling every year, and you see it in this psalm, they model it for us, every year as they walked out this psalm, they retold an old story. 
They retold a story that at this point was hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years old. Why do they retell a hundred year old story? To keep it fresh, to keep it from getting stale. Because their collective story was a story about something that had happened back then. But it wasn't just a story about something that had happened back then. It was also a story of what happens when you serve a God who is the God above all gods. Like when your gratitude stories stay fresh, it's hard for the bad news to win the day. Because the narrative changes, doesn't it? Instead of it's bad around us, it's bad between us, it's bad in front of us, and we're the kind of people for whom bad things always happen and the world's always falling apart. We don't deny the, the bad news. We don't deny the hard times. We don't deny the dark. But we refuse to stop there because we've retold the stories and we know we're not the people whose lives are constantly falling apart. We are not the people whose world is constantly in disrepair. When we refresh those stories, when we rehearse them, when we retell those stories over and over, it helps us remember we are good news people. We're the kind of people that God shows up for. He has, and he does, and he will. So d- does your family, does your spiritual family have stories of God's goodness and faithfulness that you refuse to let get stale? You need them. One of these days, if your community groups are meeting for more than three months, it would do you well to just sit down and remember and retell some of the stories where you as a group have seen God's faithfulness show up for you over the days or months or years, where you've collectively experienced God's goodness. It's a great exercise for you as a family around the dinner table this week. What are the big rock moments for us as a family that we need to refuse to let get stale? Retell those stories, especially the ones that you've heard over and over and over again. If you've heard it a thousand times, the chances are there's a reason. And you would stand to benefit from storytelling number 1001. Rhythms, retelling stories. And then finally, the psalmist lands the plane. The last few verses, he lands it for us personally. Not just the big stories for all of us over time. What are the personal stories for you? I wrote the step this way, wrote it reflection. Reflection. But notice the way it's spelled. It's part reflection. Ancient church, they built this into their ancient rhythm. They called it examine or compline. It's this practice of taking some moments at the very end of your day where you reflect on the big and the small things that you've seen that you can be thankful for just in that day. So that the very last thought on your brain before you drift off into sleep is thank you, Lord. So I've told you before, uh, about nine years ago, Carrie bought me a, a five-year journal that's been a part of a two-minute ritual that I have at just the end of every day. I've got a blank that's big enough for three or four sentences to remember where God showed up in the day. We've talked before about how powerful those moments can be when you string them together. Because when you groove gratitude into your reflection, before long, gratitude becomes a reflex. Thank you becomes the reflex of your heart when you reflect on it day after day. And in fact... Before long, you even learn to pray prayers of anticipatory thanks. Where you say, Lord, I I can't see the end of this thing. I can't see the journey along the way. And I've got a whole host of stories in my life that started that same way. They end with Tov. So Lord, thank you ahead of time for the story I know you're writing, even before I can see the end of it. That's what the psalmist models for us. That's what Jesus modeled for us, isn't it? So John chapter six, Jesus thanks his father before the loaves and the fishes were multiplied and the hungry people were filled. John chapter 11, Jesus thanks his father for hearing him before Lazarus walks out of the grave. And multiple times 
before and after his last meal before the cross, the gospel's writers tell us that Jesus paused to say thank you. And he passed it on to his followers. In fact, go ahead and grab those elements that I hope you got on the way in. If you're a follower of Jesus, this is something that he's given for us to do. Jesus said, thanks for the bread, and then he broke it. Think about that. On the way to the cross, Jesus knew what was coming. He knew he would be broken for the sins of people who didn't deserve it. He knew that his father's love would go beyond until, even while we were his enemies, that Jesus would receive the wrath of God and be broken for us. And Jesus said, thank you. Whenever you get the taste of this bread, Jesus said, don't forget to say thank you. He gave us a rhythm, a chance to retell a story, to reflect, so that that reflection becomes a heart reflex. And so we do. We take this and we remember his body broken for us and say thanks. Let's take this together. The Greek word for thank you, do you know what it is? It's Eucharisto. Some of you grew up calling this moment the Eucharist, a moment to retell a story and reflect on the never stopping, never giving up, unbreaking always and forever love that chose to be broken and poured out for us. Later in that same meal, Jesus took a cup and the gospel writers tell us he gave thanks. He said, this is a new covenant in my blood. Someday you're not going to wonder how the story will turn out. You're not going to wonder if Tov can reach you there. You're not going to question my love or my goodness or my sovereignty or my supremacy. We'll be together. You'll see me face to face. But until then, set a rhythm, retell the story, reflect, and allow it to be a part of your heart's reflex. Jesus invited us to this and then led a journey out of that room into a world where it was still dark. It was still hard. He would face unimaginable injustice and pain and abandonment and shame. All of that was still ahead of him, the worst that any human has ever faced. And along the way, on the journey, as he walked, he showed the way. He said, thank you. Remember, so we do, we remember the cup. And then the gospel writers tell us that they left that place. Jesus said thank you all the way to the cross where he died as the Passover lamb with hope to experience and hope to offer. And the chances are as they walked, the gospel writers tell us that they sang perhaps the great Hillel, all the way to the cross. So we want to live that way too. Can I pray for us? And then let's sing this psalm once again as we prepare to head back into this world. Lord, we thank you. And some of us, it's easy to say thank you because when we imagine your goodness, your love, your sovereignty, your supremacy, Lord, there are recent memories that are easy to access. Lord, we tell you thank you even for those of us for whom it's really hard this year because it feels like we're saying thank you with our backs against the wall. And yet we're reminded once again through the story of Israel and their walk through the Passover out of Egypt and across the Red Sea when they had nothing but Egypt behind them and a great sea in front of them, Lord, that you led them out with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. We're we're confident that's not just their story, it's ours because we know who Jesus is and what he's done. And Lord, I pray today for the person who doesn't know who Jesus is. They've never received what he's done for them, that today would be a day that they realize he said thank you and then was broken for them. That your wrath was poured out over him so that we could experience your joy and your goodness. We could have something to be thankful for even if there's nothing else to be thankful for because you've given us the gift of everlasting life and hope and meaning and purpose and forgiveness with you. So Lord, for the person that's never received that gift, I pray that in this moment they would. 
And then that all of us, with so much to be thankful for, would be quick to say thank you for what we see and what we haven't seen yet because you're good and your love endures forever. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, let's stand this morning. Let's respond in worship. Give thanks to the Lord, our God and King. His love endures forever. For he's good, he is above all things. His love endures forever. Sing praise. Sing praise. Sing praise. Sing praise. Hey, thanks for watching. If something you heard resonated with you today, we would love to connect with you. Visit doxology.church slash connect or leave a comment below. And if you enjoyed today's message and you wanna see more, make sure you give this video a like and subscribe to our channel so you don't miss any new videos.